people, makeovers of rooms can happen very quickly and on television programmes they can happen in an hour or two hours. But in the Octagon Room, we've been working on this space for the last 10 years in trying to understand it, unravel its history, do investigations and analysing the paint schemes, the textiles that were in here, the colours and working out how the second Lord Berwick had it in the Regency period. We spent many years with various people coming from different angles looking at the paint scheme. Doing windows, opening up areas on the walls to see what the layers of paint were. We do cross sections under microscope to analyse the layers of paint and the pigments that are contained in it. And just looking as much as we can to ally that physical evidence with the documentary evidence that's in Attingham's archive. The Octagon Room is linked very closely with the West Ante Room. We're on the west side of Attingham, which is the masculine side of the house, and was Second Lord Berwick's suite of rooms, and the Octagon Room was actually his study. In terms of the paint schemes, the Octagon Room is linked very closely with the West Ante Room. We are in the West Ante Room, which is next to the Octagon Room, and I've been uncovering all the paint layers in this room and this shows all the different layers of paint. I've numbered them all and I've gone right down to the plaster. So we've got in this room 18 layers and that includes preparation layers also for some of the paint layers. The reason we're doing this is to try and find the original paint layer or one of the original paint layers that they want to go down to. I think they want to go down to the layer dating 1813. We think it might be this sort of pale grey layer here. It's actually very difficult to get all the layers. I actually did another paint scraping on a different wall and I didn't get all the layers. Because some of the layers are very, very thin and some of them are very brittle. And so some, sometimes the layers will come, out, come off in you know, two or three layers at a time. So that's why it's quite useful to use solvents um, because then that will just thin a layer or just carefully remove a layer. Our job is to reinstate a 1813 scheme, paint scheme. Previously it had been decorated in 1977 and the scheme then wasn't historically correct in any shape or form. We're reinstating a wood graining and paint scheme using traditional materials. There is a, quite a, a build-up to, to actual completion of these decorative schemes. Several layers of base and ground colours before we, the, the final paints are glazes. In other words, they're a mix, a traditional mix of paint and varnish and oil, linseed oil, mainly to, to copy the original paint mixes. What I've been mixing here is the top coat for the walls, for the, for the grey walls. And they were painted in oil paint in the early 19th century. And because in the early 19th century they used lead paint as their base, um, lead white as their base, um, that's not really feasible to use it now because of all sorts of reasons. So I'm using a modern alkyd based paint which needs to have the stuffing knocked out of it in order to reduce the deadening effect of the titanium white base. I've added in various things like varnish and white spirit and linseed oil to make the colour glow, make it more translucent and saturated. The swirl and rosette on the ceiling in the octagon room is a motif that we see quite a lot throughout Attingham, which is why we chose it for our motif. And it's a fairly classical motif with its swirling acanthus leaves and rosette in the middle. It's quite light and delicate, even though it's a masculine room. And they are suspended, these swirls and festoons of foliage, by these little cherubs holding up garlanded ribbons. The plasterwork is three-dimensional, so it has a slight relief to it. And now with the paint scheme that we've re reinstated from the Regency period, the detail is much more visible 
and discernible in shades of stony whites and creams and off-whites. It's very delicate for a masculine space and it's the original Stuart plasterwork which survives from when the house was first built in the very late 18th century. On the walls there are about five different greys in here and we also find similar greys in the anteroom. Decoratively, in the anteroom, the main difference between the schemes seems to have been in the joinery treatment. And it's quite interesting that in the octagon room it had this fantastically fancy exotic hardwood. It's a sort of fantasy hardwood with a black ground and red veining. Very, very rich effect. And this rich effect is achieved by layer upon layer of preparatory paint of figuring, which is the red lines onto the black ground, second figuring, a first varnish layer, a second varnish layer, to try and achieve the glossiness of this fantasy wood. Normally it would have been the other way round, black figuring on a red ground, so it is an unusual scheme. And also it's not for a moment trying to make you think that it is a real kind of wood. It's similar to woods like zebra wood and coromandel, so very flashy, very flamboyant and very rich but it is a fantasy. It's not trying to fool you into thinking that this is real wood. In the anteroom, because it was a slightly lower scale room in the hierarchy, it had quite expensively treated woodwork, but it was grained in a much simpler oak, in a very simple oak uh, graining. It's almost what we would now think of as brush graining. And people who were, became used to more fancy effects, uh, more, more deceptive effects later in the 19th century would have thought this sort of graining was a bit ordinary, I suppose, because later in the 19th century they got more tools and more equipment and they had a sort of more competitive, I suppose, and they wanted to try and actually fool people that you really were looking at a piece of oak and you might have every single ray figured into it. Below the dado... All of this, including this dado rail, was um, grained. And so what I've been doing is uncovering all this overpaint to uncover the graining. And there are, in fact, two different graining schemes. This is the second graining scheme, which I think is a sort of late um, graining scheme. And it's quite dark, and it has these black lines in it. And then this is the original graining scheme, which is much lighter. And we think that it's meant to look like oak. We're basically using very pure artist quality pigment in oil and we're thinning it with turpentine and that is pretty well our mixture. And we're, we've been playing around trying to get the mixture absolutely right so that it gets this transparent ethereal quality without us working too much and having to work too hard. It's really a question of working quite quickly because you have to, in order to get the, the graining on and for it to look right. It has to be applied very quickly and then worked again very quickly. And you have to be quite sort of deft, I suppose, is the easiest way of putting it. The main thing we're, I'm very obsessed by is just getting every edge crisp and every joint neat. Interestingly, they weren't, the original graining wasn't quite so obsessive, probably. But I suppose one of the more interesting bits about Annabelle's uncoverings was in the small lobby that links the uh, anteroom with the uh, octagon room. And it's really quite a small little transitionary space, now blessed with a cupboard and it's quite low ceilinged, very plain. And it's got a mixture of joinery and plasterwork, as, in, as Nash had inherited from Stuart. As with all these rooms, they're all Stuart bones, and Nash was overlaying his decorative finishes on top. But the whole thing was wood grain. You're walking into a little timber box, because it was a little tiny lobby you just walk through. The last stage is the final varnish, which is really giving the, the correct sheen, apart from anything else. It's, these varnishes are obviously protective, but the, the final varnish has got to give the right sheen. Um, not too glossy, not too matte, just right. that happened in this room and sometimes happens when we're doing investigations in spaces. Getting up on scaffold into areas that you normally wouldn't be able to access 
On top of the lintel, if you like, of the cornice at the top of the room, we found the signature of the painters and decorators who carried out the last decorative scheme in here, which was in 1972. And we also found similar evidence in the adjoining West Ante Room when we did the decorative scheme in there. So that's always really fascinating to find the telltale evidence and the, the, the craftsmen leaving their mark on the work and the craftsmen that we employed now to carry out the redecoration left their signature alongside. I wouldn't want you to think that we recreated these decorative schemes on a whim or overnight or just because we felt like it. We had to consult with a whole range of people, both internal and external. We had to consult with English Heritage because this is a Grade 1 listed interior. We had to consult with the Arts Panel, which is our body of advisors and experts. And that's all quite right and proper and as it should be, because we need to make sure that the schemes are as historically accurate as possible so that they have integrity and that they can last within these interiors for the next hundred years or so. And it's also an absolutely fascinating process and one that it's a real privilege to be involved with because you learn a huge amount along the way and it's also really exciting and a rare opportunity to be involved with the full-scale recreation of a decorative scheme like this with all its elements.